Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace, an all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website and now an online store. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TWIST9. And by Turnstone. More than furniture, Turnstone is an experience. Go to myturnstone.com slash twist to learn more and receive 10% off your first order. And Amazon Web Services. The fastest growing, hottest startups build their businesses on Amazon Web Services. Learn more at aws.amazon.com slash startups. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. And today on the program, Life Coach Jerry Colonna, former venture capitalist, and currently one of the top five episodes of all time on This Week in Startups, is with us again to discuss the five biggest mistakes founders make. This is a must-watch episode. Stick with us. It's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like people until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. And this is This Week in Startups. Uh, if you haven't been on the program before, you haven't tuned in, you can find us at youtube.com slash thisweekin or on Twitter at TWI Startups or at thisweekinstartups.com. All of those places, we are there. And uh, today on the program, an amazing, amazing guest, one of the top 10 guests of all time and currently number five in terms of just pure viewership. Jerry Colonna is back on the program after... Just an amazing episode. What six weeks ago? Eight weeks ago? I don't know. When number I'm... five with a bullet. Number five. It's amazing. And who's next on the list? Fred Wilson. I'm gunning for you. You're gunning for Fred <laughs> Wilson. Your former partner. But it's not a competition, is it? <laughs> um, so listen, we had a great conversation last time. It yeah, went on we for an hour and a half. I got tremendous feedback on it. What was the feedback like for you? It was really gratifying. Um, probably the 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 most common comment was how frankly about you oh really yeah it was about how the fact that you actually were authentic and real hmm. not to say that you're not right but we went down to a different level we we got down to a real level and i you know i think i think part of it was the content of what we were talking about but all but also almost 20 years can we say it almost yeah, 20 it years 20. of a relationship yeah that there's a kind of trust there, and yeah, of course. and I think that uh, the people were were surprised at that. The second most common thing, which was really really gratifying, was, and I just got another email just maybe two hours ago. So many of the stories we told touch people. Ah, uh. I can't tell you the number of people who who said things like, "Yeah, my father lost his job too, and I know what that was like." Yeah. Or my father was an alcoholic. Or, you know, I'm lost in this way. And the fact that they that two guys were sitting here talking about real feelings surprised people, but more importantly, I think it gave people permission to say it at least in an email to me. Right. That this is what they were going through. Amazing. So that's why I say it was very gratifying. Yeah. You know. Part of what I want to do in the world is I know it sounds prosaic, is alleviate suffering. And in a particular part of the world that I happen to understand, these entrepreneurs, and when I get an email that, from somebody that says, you made me feel better, shit, I mean, that's gold. That's as good as it gets. That's as good as it gets. And so today on the program, we're going to go through the five biggest mistakes for founders. But before we get into that... Um, we are seeing a massive uptick in mental disease in modern society. People are more anxious, depressed. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you think that's all about? Oh, God. I'm not so sure that there is, in fact, a massive uptick. I mean, I guess you could make the argument that there is a pronounced increase in anxiety. But... When you look at some of the roots of these wisdom traditions that have dominated human civilization from Greek philosophy and Aristotle to the Buddha to Jesus to Muhammad, you know, they're all talking about the same sorts of things, which is 
it kind of sucks to be a human being. And part of the human condition is to be anxious. Hmm. You know, there is not this perfect state out there where uh, everybody's got it, somebody's got it figured out. Ah. And I'm broken because I feel anxious. When you accept the fact that struggle is part of humanity, all of a sudden struggle becomes less hard. Hmm. So is it the anxiousness that's causing people to be anxious? Like their expectation that they shouldn't be anxious That's it. is actually causing them anxiety. That's right. So how does one deal with that? How does one deal with the fact that when you have anxiety, it's actually snowballing yeah. and making you feel anxious because you have that anxiety? Can I get all Buddhist on your head? Please. So, first of all, the word Buddha hmm. means awakened one. So when the Buddha woke up to the reality of life, he realized four things. And we call them the four noble truths. The first, which is why Buddhists get a reputation as nihilist and really depressing, life is filled with suffering. And that goes back to this point I was making before, is that being anxious is the human condition, period. There is no state that it doesn't exist. Hmm. That's a powerful statement. The second noble truth, though, is really interesting which is the things that we do to push away that anxiety hmm. actually make it worse. Ah. So you buy a car. Right. So you That'll help. Powerful. Sure. Right? And then you worry about the scratch. Right. Or you build a company so that you can get out of that awful working condition that you're in. And guess what? Now you got right. 10,000 more problems. Or you make money. Ah. And then you worry about losing it. Right. Right? So when, when we set about a path of, doing things purposely to get to this imagined state mm. where we don't struggle, we actually make the conditions worse. So accepting it's a struggle, accepting it's going to be anxiety producing at time, accepting that it could be depressing, that's a big part of making now you, it Now work. you see why being, like recruiting people to Buddhism is really hard. <laughs> right. Um, so we but got remember this, yeah, I guess there's two going. other yeah. noble truths, right? The third noble truth is the truth of the end of suffering, hmm. the cessation of suffering. And the fourth is what's known as the Eightfold Path. And relevant to our conversations, one of the steps in that is right livelihood. It's working in a way, being a way in the world that actually moves towards alleviation of suffering. Hmm. And there's a funny thing that actually coincides with Western psychology which is that the less focused on your own satisfaction you are, the more likely you are to feel good. Right. It's called compassion. Right. So that's the Buddhist answer to it. It ain't the only answer by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, we've heard similar things from psychologists, right? Like the gratitude exercise or exactly. showing gratitude. This is behavioral. I think that's more cognitive psychology is that's obviously right. a play on it as well. That's right. If you show gratitude for the people around you, it's that's actually right. better than experiencing gratitude from other people. That's right. That's right. When I, when I talk about work-life balance, for example, mm. um, you know, I have a famous blog post called Work-Life Balance is Bullshit. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because the concept of work-life balance creates its own suffering. What it basically says is that work is in opposition to life and that you are fucked because you can't balance the two. Hmm. Nobody can balance the two. It's impossible. You're always going to be thinking about some other place than where you are. So That's, when you're with your kids on the beach... You're thinking about work. You're thinking, my God, I should be at work right now. Right. And when, and when you're at work... You're thinking about, oh, what a terrible parent I am. I should be with my kids at the beach. Right. And you're never happy. What I always say is that it, it, what you really want, the balance you want is one-third, one-third, one-third. One-third for the inner you, hmm. one-third for the outer you, and this is really important, and one-third for the other. Hmm. Like one-third of the time not worrying about your own small little problems. Hmm. Interesting. Right. So I just got back from two and a half weeks in Tibet 
where I, this is my fourth trip there, where I support a school, where you know I do earthquake relief work, where I support a social entrepreneurship program because the best way to preserve Tibetan culture is to create economic opportunity. And you and I both know the power of entrepreneurship and yeah. cre creating economic opportunity. When I invest time in that, a funny thing happens. I feel better. Hmm. Anxiety goes down, depression Anxiety goes down. Anxiety goes down. And not, not because of that sort of guilty thing of like, eat your vegetables, there are starving children in India, right. which is just guilt. Right. But because of the reality of getting out of your own crazy mind. Right. The right. monster in your head. When you, when you actually try to feed somebody who's hungry, yeah. you have a hard time worrying about all the things that you stand there and worrying about. Fascinating. All right, let's get to number one. Okay. Because we got to give people some anchors here to, to really think about. This is your number one mistake that founders make, diluting right. yourself and your team. Right. So <laughs> self-delusion, right. which is a little bit different than deception. Mm -hmm. right? Deception is sort of wantonly lying, which CEOs do all the time. Okay, so deceiving your team. Yeah. Deceiving your team, deceiving your investors, yeah, that's spinning. Bad. <laughs> it's kind of kind of bad. Yeah. But maybe spinning the press a little bit, not so bad. But okay. But I think that equally important or maybe even more important is deluding yourself. And what do I mean by that? So I often tell this, here's another Buddhist story for you. There's a very famous Buddhist saint named Milarepa. And I call him a badass because when he was young, he watched his family get killed and he became a murderer. Hmm. And he used to wear uh, uh, the finger bones of his murder victims around his neck. Hey, oh. Who are you? Hey. But that's all right. Milarepa yeah. met Marper and his life changed. Milarepa is also famous because he spent 20 years meditating in a cave. And one day, he goes out of the cave to gather firewood. And he comes back, and the cave is filled with demons. Now, in Buddhist cosmology, this means emotions. This means, like, suffering. Right. So he does what any right-thinking person would do. He starts to bat them around, chase them out of the cave. Get out, get out, get out. And what happens? Nothing. Hmm. They, in fact, multiply. Okay. So then he gets the bright idea. I'm going to teach them the Dharma. I'm going to teach them Buddhism. And they all sit like little children, and they listen quietly. But actually, nothing changes. Hmm. Then he says, what are you here to teach me? And one by one, they start to disappear, hmm. except for one. And the one that remains is a big, hairy, blood-curdling demon. And to this one, he puts his head up to the mouth of the demon and he says, eat me if you wish. And the demon disappears. Hmm. Now, as I often joke, to me, that's obviously a business story. <laughs> yeah. Right? Obviously. Because are you willing to put your head up to the mouth of the demon? Guess what? Product doesn't work. Hmm. Guess what? You don't know what you're doing. Hmm. Guess what? You're running out of cash. Right. Are you really willing to put your head up to the mouth of the demon and face reality? Hmm. You know, we talked about Buddhism before. I don't like to think of Buddhism as a religion. I think of it as a philosophy. Right. And it's a philosophy that doesn't really care about God. It's a philosophy that's designed to deal with reality. The reality is you're going to run out of cash. Everybody will. What are you going to do about it? Make money. <laughs> right? Right. Just whistle past the graveyard? Right. Right? Pretend that the product was working? Right. Pretend that what's going on? And so when I think of all the mistakes that I see, this one, which I understand, it's rooted in fear. It's rooted in fear of being humiliated or fear of failure. You know, we've talked about the consequences of the fear of failure before. The notion of deceiving your own self, right, right, leads to not recognizing that actually you're the asshole in the company, hmm. not everybody else. Right, you're the one whose sense of uh, of criticism is so out of control that nobody wants to work for you. Hmm. You know, there's an old line which is, if the first five people you meet in the morning are assholes. Guess what? <laughs> the a-hole is you. You got it. Yeah. Right? Are you willing to admit that? Okay. So facing 
these fears, facing well, facing these realities. Facing reality. Reality. Because it's not even fears. Because it's not fears. Because right. fear actually prevents you from facing reality. Right. These are actual realities. Like, hey, this person quit with no notice. Oh, this person, uh, I, I have this many weeks of cash left. Oh, this VC backed out of the term sheet after agreeing, and I, now I'm up the creek. That, 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 that's a great example. You know, um, and th this goes to you know, diluting the staff. I, I once had a client who, said, who was struggling to raise money, thought he had gotten a term sheet, realized he didn't get a term sheet, called me up, said, what do I tell the staff? I said, how about the truth? Yeah, that works. He said, but they'll all leave. I said, would you rather them stay for a lie? Right. And the truth is they're going to stay. They're going to the rally. The truth is they all volunteered to take a pay cut for a month. Sure. People will surprise you like that. Exactly. exactly. All right. When we get back from commercial break, the next four biggest mistakes that founders have to look out for. Stick with us. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. What a great episode we're having. And it's made possible by our friends at Squarespace. Squarespace provides 24-hour support for creating exceptional-looking sites. And when they say exceptional-looking sites, they mean gorgeous. I use Squarespace all the time. It's so easy to set up, drag and drop, 24-hour support with the team in New York, and a great team it is. And now they add commerce. So if you wanted to, and you were previously going to get like web hosting from one post person, and site building from another, and then commerce from another... It's all coming together at Squarespace. So in the old days, you had to have one person, like a sysop, set up a server for you somewhere, and then you had a designer design something, and then they talked to a coder, and then you got some third party to put in your e-commerce. You had four or five people in the kitchen, and it was a disaster. Disaster. Listen to me. Now you get it all in one service from Squarespace. They vertically integrated everything, and it's so easy to use, and it's so affordable that I use it myself. And everything is made to be uh, automated and just fluid for when you uh, go mobile. And listen, half your customers are going to be coming from mobile and more eventually. So that was like the fifth or sixth cook in the kitchen, the person who made your site mobile and then making two different websites. She's not supposed to have two different websites. She should have one website that just works brilliantly. And uh, here's Truth and Lies, a t-shirt company. And then here's the beautiful, uh, beautiful Mole Cola. Uh, and gorgeous, when you, when you hover over these different element boxes, different things happen, like animations. Gorgeous. This is the kind of stuff that you would pay an agency tens of thousands of dollars for, and it is free with your Squarespace subscription. Uh, but more importantly, look at this. Here's the launch um, event for Launch Mobile. Let me just scroll to the top here. And this was a disaster for us. We would have so many people working on the website, and like, we would get a great speaker, we'd get a great... Um, you know, uh, event going on, like poker at night, like we're going to do at Launch Mobile. And I'd say, hey, put that on the website. And it would be six, seven days before it was on the website. And then I would go crazy as a CEO. What's going on? Why is it on the website? And they'd say, oh, well, you know, this person has to do the HTML, then this person has to push it. I said, listen, enough, enough nonsense, enough shenanigans. I don't want a brouhaha every time that I need the website updated. And thus, we went to Squarespace, and now uh, everything gets updated. And look, these gorgeous menus, I love these so much because we can promote all the other things we're doing, like the ticker and the other events. And when you scroll down, look, here is the secondary menu for tickets, applying, speakers. And uh, it all just moves beautifully. And look at this beautiful speaker list. When we put the photos up and we uh, size them and we put the titles of everybody, that's all done just by a normal civilian, somebody with no technical skill or no real like HTML skill. They just update the website constantly. We have three or four people now in the organization who can update the website as opposed to one or two. Let me give you an offer code here. No credit card required. Only $8 a month is where it starts. And if you decide to keep your trial, use the offer code TWIST9. TWIST9. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. Go to squarespace.com and try it out free. No credit card required. Starts at only $8 a month. And if you decide to keep the trial, just use TWIST9. Everybody should be using Squarespace. It's a massive competitive advantage. It's incredibly affordable. And it's elegant and simple. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring the program. Let's get back to the program. Okay. All right. So when we left, diluting yourself and the team is very bad. But I want caveat to that. What about being delusional in the challenge? Like, hey, we're going to create, you know, something that's going to take on CNN, right? This insurmountable thing. Yeah, I don't. Where's the line between believing you can do it and yeah. delusion? I, you know, I mean, our our mutual friend Hugh McLeod has that great yeah. cartoon that says, "I'm not delusional. I'm an entrepreneur." Um, I don't think of that as delusional. I think of that as. You know, I once called it, said to Jonathan Fields, pathologically optimistic. Um, that's different. 
Uh, delusional, being delusional is a psychological condition where you're basically lying to yourself. Right. Right. And inducing in the team hmm. the same kind of lie. Hmm. Right. Versus deceiving, knowingly deceiving your investors. See, it really does feel like three things, right? Because there, there's just straight up deception, which is lying and cheating right. and bad and all, all different right. ways. And then, then there's spinning. Right, there's a little bit of spinning. That's different. I'll put that on as a caveat on the side. As a guy who spends his life spinning? Who? Of you! I don't spin, but I have been known to weave a tail. The P.T. Barnum of the tech industry. People have said that. Hopefully I'm a little <laughs> bit more sober than that as I got older. But I was always enthusiastic. See, I always took umbrage to that, call me P.T. Barnum, because I was just enthusiastic about stuff. I didn't think I was always... Did you believe it? Yeah. Then you, weren't, then you weren't delusional. See, that's the thing is, I always believed right. in those early years that the internet would be the most transformative thing of our lifetime. Yeah, but did you always believe in what you were selling? Yeah. That's good. I did. Then, well, I mean... Then, I, I See, I find it difficult to sell when I don't believe. Oh, I can. So, I can't sell something I don't believe in. So I can't go to work in the morning if I don't believe in it. Right. I right. just get like... I, guys, I can't do this. This right. is not working. Right. Like, I'm just, but I've been called delusional many times. That, but I that, think I, I think I might be falling into that relentless optimism thing. I think I think it's pathological optimism. Pathological. I think I think that I think that 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 optimism. There's a big difference between delusion and optimism. Hmm. Um, uh, delusion. You know, it, it goes back to the discussions we've had before about the difference between stubbornness and resiliency, mm -hmm. right? Delusion contributes to a kind of stubbornness, right? I believe that the world is going to come around and be this way and that sort of, And all the indications are the other way. Mm -hmm. Optimism and resiliency are, we will find a way, mm. that's a kind of belief in self or a belief in the team or a belief in the ideal. That's right. different. Yeah. You know, and I think you believed in what it was that you were trying to sell. Right. Yeah, that's hustle, right? Like, you can be like a hustler and like really want it to happen and know you're going to figure it out some way. Like Christopher Columbus, right? Or uh, Shackleton, like those adventurers. I don't think they were delusional as much as they thought, I'm resourceful and resilient enough to figure this out. I will get there. Right. I mean, you know, you mentioned Shackleton, and I, I think we've talked before about my client, Ben Saunders, mm. who's the polar explorer. Right. right. I'm going to see him next week in London. He's leaving October 5th to ski from McMurdo to the South Pole and back with one other mate, unsupported. This is a four-month journey. Now, you could argue he's delusional. I think he's determined. Right. I think he, you know, there's a metaphor in there for that pathological optimism, you know. But what has been hit most interesting is he's probably spent the better part of 17 years preparing himself for this trip. Do people think he's going to die or something on this trip? Jason, no one in human history has ever done this. So there is the a good last, chance. <laughs> Death is a, is a possibility. The last person who tempted was Captain Scott, who died on the way back. Hmm. That was a hundred years ago. But he does have the ability to send up a flare or you know whatever. Well, he has a satellite like phone. Yeah, yeah. So he can get and help. he's being sponsored by Intel and Land Rover. Right. So he will be able to be rescued, right. unless of course they can't find him. Right. On a continent that is one of the largest continents. In See, the it was world. like when that I saw the like, the sixty minutes episode where a guy was climbing up. Um, El Capitan or whatever it was, and he was a free climber. Mm. Did you see this kid? Yeah, this kid with the huge hands. With the huge hands. <laughs> yeah, right. And he's being interviewed um, by Laura, whatever her name is, and yeah. he is on a suicide mission to kill himself by climbing without a rope, and nobody's telling him. I just thought that was delusional, that he's not going to run into water at some point or sneeze and fall off a cliff. Or maybe he won't. Or maybe he won't. See, that's, maybe it's the danger... Associated with I mean, the that's. The, the, I think you're dealing with the adrenaline addiction, which is a little bit different. Yeah, that's different. And you're, you're dealing with other motivations that are going on with people. I don't think that's delusion. I think that anybody who is so care... I mean, my client, Ben, cuts the corners off of the, his packets of freeze-dried food in order to save weight. Right. Okay. That's preparing. Right. Right. Can you, as a business person, say that you've cut the corners off of your packets of freeze-dried food in order to save weight? 
No. That's not delusional. No. That's clever. All right, number two. Number two, merging yourself with your business or product. You got this memorized. Well, you know, it's what I deal with every day. So we've gotten into this a little bit. This is when you, what, become synonymous with the brand or? Well, as we've talked about before, when you you saw yourself as Silicon Alley reporter and Silicon Alley reporter as you, when you lost sight of the fact that, that there's something other than you that exists. Remember my, my comment before about work-life balance and the notion of having one-third, one-third, one-third. One of the benefits of having that one-third, one-third, one-third rule is that it forces you to think about something other than the thing that you are obsessed about. Hmm. Right? It could be family. It could be friends. You know, it, it sort of breaks that up. Now, I'm not talking about not being obsessively focused on the work that's in front of you. When Ben leaves on October 5th... He better be. He he better be, and he is going to be completely focused on it. But he knows that there's something out there. There's something waiting for him when he comes back. Right. And that is as important, right... So when you spend 90 hours a week at work Hmm. and you know that London's birthday party is coming up, right? Yeah. It forces this kind of disruption of the the obsession. Right. Right? You can just like get some forced balance in there. It it, it causes you to to break the addiction to seeing seeing the product as yourself and yourself as the product. Is this something that happens mostly to first-time entrepreneurs? Because I find as my career has gone on and I've created so many different brands, I mean, I built a company of brands. So when I built Weblogs Inc. and I had, you know, whatever it got up to, 100 different blogs, I didn't feel so identify with any one. It wasn't like, oh, well, this is in Gadget or Autoblog or this one or this conference or that conference. It, it almost like as you get older, you're like, well, I'm the guy who makes the thing. Well, what happens when we and get older? Wiser. Theoretically. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. I think, I think it's a function not so much of chronological age hmm. or even status or, hmm. you know, are you married? Do you have children? You know, do you have a relationship or, you know, I don't know that it's so much that as much as whether or not you've actually done the work to ask yourself these sort of questions. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that that failure forces you to do is to confront some of the underlying issues. You know, I remember I did a workshop in Berlin based on this topic called Disappearing Into the Fire and really good guy who helped me organize the thing said to, said at the time when we were talking about why did you work so hard to organize this he said if i had known then what i know now i would not have ended up in a divorce hmm. i'm remarried i don't want to get divorced again right he had merged himself with the product he was just too obsessed and then the company I mean, failed in a, in a way we, we don't we'll never know exactly what was going through jody's mind but in a way it did feel like he was the ego mom and this is like, if this thing fails... If this thing fails. Well, that's yeah. the whole... That's the danger, right? Mm. If this thing fails, you know, as William James says, it is not failure that annihilates us. It's when we attach our self-esteem and our identity to accomplishment of the goal and then fail right. that we are annihilated. Interesting. I just had some profound thought about failure, which was... I found that the people who try the hardest and sort of, they have such an increased likelihood of failure, yet they seem to be, ba- you know, have, have balanced this issue of merging yourself. So I was just thinking about Elon Musk who I was having dinner with the other night and like, you know, he released the Hyperloop and we're talking about the hi- Hyperloop. Mm. Every time we say Hyperloop, everybody goes dude, like, dude, you got to j- jazz go, Hyperloop. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's from the Simpsons when they say right. monorail. Right. So everybody goes, Hyperloop. So anyway, <laughs> it's a funny moment. It's like, now he's like the Hyperloop is almost like become a, I don't want to say it's a joke kind of thing, but it's like what he does in his spare time, right? Like, right. And so if the rocket ships blow up, he's got the car company, if the car company goes blow up, he's, you know, he's got the Hyperloop. If not, you know, he had a shot or whatever. But it's almost like there seems to be some people are not, they don't have the fear gene. Yeah. Well, they don't have the fear of failure gene. The fear of failure gene. Right. They, 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 that's that resiliency we were right. talking about. Is right. Do you have the capacity 
to dust yourself off and yeah. do it again. Those people, forget, I don't know Alan at all, but, but those people tend to be able to withstand the ups and downs of being an entrepreneur much better. Much better. If you can internalize, remember we were talking about suffering. If you can internalize the fact that anxiety is part of the human condition, if you can internalize the fact that failure is a part of being a CEO, of being a startup person, have fun. You know what the thing that gets me is when there's multiple things in the same day. What do you mean? Like, I'm fine with bad news, right? Like, if you've got 20 years under your belt, you know it's going to be bad news, right? And it, essentially, the job of CEO, which we'll get into the next sort of point, mm. is almost like if everybody else can't solve the problem, save it for the CEO or the founder, right? So mm -hmm. it's like everybody worked really hard this week, and at the end of the week, there were seven problems that just absolutely could not be found. Guess what? Here they are for you, CEO, founder. Mm -hmm. Now it's your job to try to work with these people to figure out the seven hardest problems because the easy ones got done. You didn't even mm -hmm. know they were problems. They just got routed around. But what do you do when you get these things backed up? Like you get a phone call that the, you know, the term sheet is off, your top CTO resigns, and the partner who you were you know, going to do this big partnership goes out of business or the CEO of that company gets fired, and now you got like three of these things all at once. How does one... Well, what I do when I, when I, have to, when I encounter a client who's going through that or experiencing that kind of thing, and that back-to-back that -back thing can go on for weeks, if yeah. not months. It's like the bad news parade, right? Right. What I try to do is bring them back to purpose. Hmm. And I usually ask a simple question. Why did you start this business in the first place? You know, um, when, when you can remind yourself of what that initial uh, enthusiastic eureka moment was, mm. holy shit, wouldn't it be great if, right. right, and how that compelled you. When you can remind yourself that you're, in, you're, you're going through this for a particular reason, then it somehow uh, makes it easier to withstand those things. It doesn't make them themselves easier but like we were talking a lot about my my client ben when i remind him that what he's attempting to do has never been done before in the history of humanity okay it's hard it's what hard. did you expect <laughs> what did you expect right right so you know and if you do this this is what will happen you know uh Almost always, the thing that motivates people is this sense of changing the world in some little capacity, some way, making the world a little bit better. It might be for themselves, or it might be answering some, some, some deep demon within them. But if they can connect back to that, then they generally can withstand that roller coaster, can withstand the barrage. Having allies, you know, we were talking about the boot camp before, having a peer network people to just call and say, you know, God, let me tell you about my day. Right. Having a spouse who understands can help, too. Mm. You know, Brad and Amy Feld in uh, Startup Life, uh, which is a great book, by the way. Highly recommend Startup Life by Brad and Amy Feld. Brad Feld, Amy Bachelor. Sorry, Amy. Um, really talks about the role of, uh, of the spouse of the entrepreneur and the power of that relationship and what it can do for that person. Um, having that relationship uh, can really, really be, be a big help. All right. When we get back from commercial break, let's talk about number three, not understanding the role of the CEO. Yeah. When we get back from these very important messages, stick with us. Hey, my turnstone, my turnstone. Simple, smart, gorgeous furniture solutions. As a matter of fact, I'm at a, uh, my turnstone desk right now. This is the stand-up desk. I use this every day. You can't see it right now. Um, but I stand up at a desk all day long. Sometimes I go sit at my regular turnstone desk, but these are gorgeous desks. You can think about them. I like to think about them as like, there's that company where you get all the furniture that's in a box and you pick it up yourself and then you assemble it and then it breaks three months later. And then there's like high, 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 high like five, $6,000 a workstation rip off companies that come in with a consultant and then they charge you through the nose and all of a sudden you wonder where your angel round went. It went to $5,000 workstations. This is right in between those two. 
It's a fair price for an amazing, gorgeous, gorgeous uh, product. We use it here. And look, if you go to myturnstone.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, you'll get 10% offer off your first offer. This is very significant. 10% on a hardware product, on an actual physical product, is a lot. Because, you know, the, it's not like it's software where it's free. This is physical product. They're giving 10% off to our uh, the, to the folks here uh, who listen to the show. MyTurnstone.com slash twist. 10% off the first order. And uh, it's gorgeous. You can see here in the photos that I'm showing, it's absolutely gorgeous. But I just noticed this other thing they came up with. Um, where is it? Uh, there it is. What do they call this? Buoy? I, I got to get some of these. I don't have a buoy. But look, this buoy, you sit on it. And it's, I guess it's, it lets you uh, activate your core, and you can raise the height of it, and it comes in all these groovy colors. Because everybody wants to sit on balls all day long because it activates your core, and it's supposed to be healthier for you. You can rock around a little bit. Um, I want to get one. You say, can somebody get me one or two of these for the office? I'm going to start sitting on this because I like to stand, but sometimes I need to sit. This would be a perfect uh, solution. Looks gorgeous, and uh, everybody check out the buoy, B U O. Why? Very well done, my turnstone. A little surprise there. And uh, send a picture of yourself grinding away at your turnstone desk to turnstone at launch.co. So if you got a turnstone desk, send a picture to turnstone at launch.co and you could win a free lunch with me. Hey, that's good. That's a good prize. And a free buoy from turnstone. Myturnstone.com slash buoy. Contest ends September 25th. Go ahead and email yourself at your turnstone desk, turnstone at launch.co. All right, let's get back to the program. Yeah. Hmm. So let's talk about this. Understanding the role of the CEO, number three on your list yeah. of the biggest mistake founders make. So, what do people? What's the mistake? What, what are they? Well, you know, I often draw a pyramid, hmm. okay, and I and I stick the CEO at the top of the pyramid, and I say, recognize this org chart, yeah, and everybody goes, yeah, and that's the problem. <laughs> flip it, <laughs> okay. Not only do you flip it into a classic servant leadership model, huh. but the problem with that. Putting the CEO in what I often think of as the godlike position yeah. is that it, in, it, it causes the individual to think that they're supposed to know the answer to all the questions. So think of your own, your own example before. It's the end of the week, seven insurmountable problems get dumped on the lap of the CEO. I would say that there's a problem in the organization if that's, in fact, what's going on. Right. There's a problem for the CEO because they shouldn't be taking those problems, and there's a problem in the organization. And it goes both ways. The CEO oftentimes thinks they're the one who's supposed to do everybody's job better than them. That's why there's a CEO. Yeah. Wrong. Your job is to hire people who are better than you at doing their job. So why, why do people get that wrong? It seems so obvious, so easy. Like hire people with the, who are better at that individual skill. Is that just people are scared? Well, if you've merged your sense of self with the product, then uh. nobody really understands the product better than you. Hmm. Right? Uh, Steve Jobs syndrome or... You well, who know, knows? Uh, yeah, I, I want. I, I've I, I've had an interesting encounter with uh, with a guy who knew Steve very very well, and I would say, uh, and he helped me understand Steve a little bit better just this past weekend. And I would say that the first iteration of Steve Jobs, ah, right, and it's not just Steve. It's it's it's. It's this, this phenomena of, and, and we have a system that causes that individual to put themselves into that position. We have investors who say, I'm backing you. Right. Right. We have, we have employees who come to work for you. Right. Right. So there's a system that actually induces this and brings this along. And oftentimes it's necessary to break free of gravity. Right? To get escape velocity requires a powerful leader. Requires the leader to see themselves as this sort of compelling person. Right. But, you know, as we've talked about in the past, and, you, you know, you've interviewed Warren Bennis, a functional CEO tells the truth yeah. and asks what needs to be done. Hmm. What do you need? When you get into that role, when the CEO gets into that role of really seeing themselves as making it possible for everybody else to succeed, the whole thing starts to flip. Now, the downside to this is that employees don't necessarily want this. Hmm. Although they may claim to on surveys, I want more freedom and responsibility and ability to decision-making. They actually don't. They actually don't. It's a lot easier to just say, like, hey, this is a difficult decision that could get me fired. You make it. Or just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do syndrome. No independent critical thinking. Right. So you, what is the goal then as an entrepreneur? You got to try to create well, moments well, where people get to make their own decision or talk to you about their decision-making process. 
I say that the the and Fred Fred Wilson and Brad Feld and I all say the same thing. The role of the CEO is to do three things: hold a vision, build and maintain the staff, and give them what they need to succeed. If you have all three of those things, then what ends up happening is you start to get a very high functioning organization, and that's where people start to release themselves. They start to become more much more effective in their jobs. Hmm. And your capacity to withstand the ups and downs of the job all of a sudden get better. Your enjoyment as CEO goes up when you step into that role, when you take your seat as CEO. All right, let's go to number four, being unclear. This is a huge mistake for people, huh? This is huge. This is huge. Lack of clarity is probably the single biggest problem. What's your job? How do you know if you're going to succeed? What will it take for you to fail? Hmm. What will it take for you to be fired? Oftentimes, people don't know until they've been fired. Right? How do you expect people to do their job if they don't have a job description? You, you're, you're building inside.com. Right. Right. I'm sure it's all developers at this point. Developers, a designer, and some marketers, and there'll be some editorial Okay, folks, so yeah. who makes the design decisions? Is it the developer, the designer, or you? The designer. Are you sure? Clearly. Okay. If then there's a jump clear. ball, if there's a, and if there's a jump ball, it's a discussion between me, the designer, and the CTO. Okay. And in general, I get to win the jump balls. But that, yeah, I heard. But that. I'll be honest. But that's because I'm a design guy, you know. And no, you're I, not. Let me, let me. No, but no, I am. No, you're a not. De- I've designed. Where did you Where did you get your design degree? I took a couple courses, but anyway, the, <laughs> <laughs> I did take a couple courses. But I'll, okay, here's what I'll tell you: in a decision where I don't have an overwhelming preference, this is how I handle it. Yeah. Many times I'll just say I don't think that this is a very meaningful one to me, Yeah. make what you think is the best decision. Right. But then sometimes I'll see something, I'll go, you know what, I really dislike that, right. or I really love that, and I want more of that and less of that. Well, that's helpful. And so, like, for example, iOS 7 came out, and the sharing button is just absolutely disgusting. Mm. And, and I you saw it. it. And, you, and, and yeah. I knew it immediately. I was like, that is the most disgusting thing. I said, where the, get rid of that. And it was like, actually, that's not even my design. I didn't say it that fiercely, but I just said, I really don't care for that. And it was like, oh, well, that's actually Johnny Ivy made that yeah. at Apple. And we're all suffering through it. I agree. Right. And I was like, all right, well, in that decision, then we have a really difficult decision to make, which is, do we keep the share button that Johnny Ive put right. in there, or do we go with our own? Right. I don't know. So I, I like to say, this is one of my leadership things I've learned, is if trying to determine how important the decision is, so that we can frame, is this a really something we should be having a long discussion about or a short discussion about? Well, I think that goes back to the whole question of deluding yourself. Right. Sometimes, I mean, oftentimes I see a CEO mucking around in programming or, you know, figuring out, you know, just work that they should not be doing hmm. because they're really avoiding ah. work that they're, tr- that they're supposed to be doing or, you know, avoiding more difficult conversations, avoiding difficult decisions. They, they, you know, I once had a CEO who used to spend his evenings checking the box scores for the Red Sox. Whenever that was going on, I knew he was avoiding something. <laughs> right? There was something going on. You know, oh, I was up late last night, you know, checking on the Red Sox. Okay, well, what's what's happening here? They lost to the Yankees anyway, so let's not what? worry about it. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, how bad do you want to see? Do not want to talk about the Yankees this season. Exactly. <laughs> don't want to talk about the Yankees this season. <laughs> but I think being clear is. Um, that is just super important, man. And, and you know what I find interesting? Even when I feel I am being clear, I have people say to me, that wasn't clear. Right. And I say, but I said it so clearly. And there's an email that says so clearly. How does one get through to the people who say, like, it's still not clear? Like, or how do you avoid that? Because I... Well, let me make, make sure I understand yeah. your question. What you're asking me is, how does one really make sure that one is being understood. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I just did it. Oh, look at that, huh? Right? That's why you're in your seat and I'm in mine. Right. It's just a simple little technique. Which is, which did, is, is that clear? M- notice what I did. I uh, mirrored back what was going on. Uh, right? And it's just a simple little technique of saying, okay, let's be clear. Hmm. This, is what's, this is what I've heard. This do I have that right? Now, you had the chance to say, no, that wasn't what I meant. Mm. Okay. Then you get to right. tell me again. Right. Right. So that's one thing. And that's just simple communications technique, which right. every marriage counselor in the country teaches. Right. 
But there's other uh, techniques. There's repetition. Hmm. Guess what? People do need to be told to t- again and again and again. And yes, you have to find new ways to tell it. You have to say things over and over again. That's part of your job. You have to hold a vision. You have to be able to promulgate things. You have to be able to find new and inventive and exciting ways to say the same things. All right, let's get to the last one. Number five, avoiding difficult, fearful, or challenging situations, people, or conversations. Well, it's like a client I had who uh, took two years to fire his co-founder. Two years. Two. Two years. Not one, two. Two years. Not one, two months, two years. Right, two years to fire his co-founder. Everybody knew, including both parties, but nobody dealt with it. So they let him vest for two years. Forget about the vesting. You're, yes, you, you immediately go to that. Think about the damage that does oh, of the course, organization. Yeah. The organization grew, hundreds of people, and there's the, you know, well, what's Johnny doing over in the corner? Nothing. Nothing. We've given him busy work. But we're not talking about it, and we're not dealing with it. Hmm. Right? This is the hardest thing. Are there people who do the opposite, that when there are situations that occur, they almost are drawn to, like, Oh, that's a that's a difficult decision, or that's a difficult situation. Let me just get on top of it, and like they're just too. I think up there in are. Pe- I think there are people who cover their fear with aggression, hmm. and convince themselves, delude themselves into thinking that they're being clear. Hmm. But I, I I can't think of a situation where somebody is so on top of it that they're just jumping on things that are difficult hmm. in that way. I don't know. I mean, no, I'm just curious because I've seen CEOs who are like. I'm almost like, why are you worrying about that? I understand it's... Why are you letting that person go? Or Yeah, they might get a little bit too obsessive about something that... Uh, maybe somebody, the common way to say it would be, that's below your pay grade. Like, don't obsess too much about that, right? Oh, and the example would be like Steve Jobs obsessing about some minor detail or whatever. Right. And they make a federal case out of something that's not a federal case. Well, again, I think that that's, you know, I, I, I think there's very, very few instances where aggression mm. is a good management technique. Mm. And that's aggressive. Okay. But that's But not yet the some same. of the most successful companies are run by aggressive a-holes. So how do we reconcile this? Because people would say... Right, this is, this is the $64,000 question. The Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, like this guy was so aggressive and so crazy. He ran over people. Uh, you know, who knows what happened exactly. We weren't there. But people do say this sometimes. Right. Well... Do you think those people are here, more successful? Here's what, we do. Here's what do we bad don't. guys win? I think that bad guys can win in the short term. Mm-hmm. And I think that the good guys win in the long term. Hmm. And I think that, um, you know, again, I, I talked about meeting one of Steve's co-founders at one of his most latest companies this weekend. And we had a long talk about this. And, you know, I asked that question because it comes up all the time. And the first thing that I often talk about, I often quote Joel Spolsky about this. And when hmm. he says, you know, remember, you're not Steve Jobs. <laughs> and that's really important. Let's okay. start there. So just because you're, you're mimicking the asshole behavior doesn't yeah. mean you're mimicking the brilliance. Right. Okay. And does Larry the, Ellison is brilliant. Does the brilliance afford you a little bit of being an asshole? Sure. People will forgive you. Oh, I don't know about that. Ah. Uh, people will tolerate. I don't even know about that. Hmm. But the world, uh, because if you create a brilliant product, right, right, there it is, forgives a lot. It forgives a lot because it's success, because I'm not encountering your personality if I like the car I'm driving. Right. right. Okay. But I think in the Steve Jobs case, what people don't really understand is that most of his biggest success came after his biggest failures. Right. Being forced out at Apple. Yeah. And having next. and next was a humiliation. Oh my god. It was going to be his revenge. Yeah, and it was brilliantly executed and conceived and still failed. I mean, I can't imagine what it was like to call Bill Gates and ask for a two hundred fifty million dollar loan to make payroll. People forget that. Yeah. Okay. And he didn't quit. And he didn't quit. He stayed with that. Right. And I think that kind of resiliency may have been as much of a contributor mm-hmm. to his post life or his later life success as his quote unquote assholeness. Hmm. Now, whether or not he was an asshole, I don't know. Yeah, see, I think this has gotten a little bit folklorish. I mean, that's why I always say, like, we weren't there, we don't know, because I don't think that he could have been 
you know, as brutal as people say, especially in his later life, if so many people were so loyal to him for so many decades. Well, the the, the people who were most loyal to him yeah. were people who worked with him in the latter half of his life. Right. Which says something. Yeah, people maybe, do change. Oh, absolutely. Right. And so it is possible. So maybe the best route is to be an absolute, unmitigated asshole for the first, first half of your career, and then see the light and be actually really sweet and nice to people. Yeah, okay. What are we telling people here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> right, right. Wow. You gave us a bonus. Externalizing responsibility for everything. Externalizing responsibility for everything. This sounds like Catholic guilty behavior that I am guilty of. Well, it, what I mean by that is this notion that um, externalizing things and saying, you know, you know, we were talking before about the first five people you meet in the morning. If they're a problem, then maybe God Oh, I see. So the opposite of internalizing. Got it. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's projecting onto everybody else that the problem is. Oh. Uh, you know, the situation is unclear because you can't, you're not listening. <laughs> right? right. Rather than turning back and saying, okay, what am I doing? And this goes back to facing your own demons, right? If you walk into an organization, if you if you are obsessed, we talked about it the last time, if you're obsessed with the really de- putting to rest some of the challenges from your childhood, and that's a big motivation mm. for you, and you don't acknowledge that, chances are really, really great that you're going to externalize what's going on, mm. and you're going to be disconnected from the reality of what's happening. Problem with that is that it just sows seeds of distrust. The organization, the pe- people standing around watching you and saying, "What the, you know, this is crazy. Why am I doing this thing? What is going on?" Here? Yeah, why am I going to work every day for this guy? Why am I going to work every day for this guy? Exactly. I think I yeah. See, I do the opposite. I internalize responsibility when people. That's the Catholic guilt. Yeah, see, that's what I do. Is I internalize if people do something wrong. Like if I, you know, I had somebody do something like. This one particularly made me upset. Mm. People went to lunch, and these were people who are hourly and have to like record their hours, which is a very unstartup thing. But in certain positions, you have to record your hours because in California, you will get sued if people do not get paid for an hour of overtime. So, like under forty thousand dollars, your position, video editor, or you can you can you can be investigated if they don't take lunch. You, exactly. It's crazy. So you have to force people to do this. Okay, so fine. I, I told the HR company, fine, I'll do that. So then somebody goes to lunch, or two people, and they take out their iPhones, mm. and they check in and out remotely, mm. which essentially is stealing mm. from the company. What do you mean? Like, they say, I'm back at my desk. Oh, I see. Even though yeah, I'm still at lunch, or so I left for lunch. they their time They card. punched their time at lunch. Right. And, you know, took an extra hour of lunch or whatever. And then, of right. course, I got to find out about it. And then I just think to myself, I go mental over the stuff. Tell me. I start thinking, like, how did I hire somebody who would do something like that? Then I start thinking, how did I not communicate to them or build a loyalty in them that they would do something like that? That's like, so I take it as my responsibility. What? Like, I did yeah. something wrong. What did they say when you asked them about it? They said. Or, well, first of all, how did you ask them? The HR person came, we had a meeting, and I said, guys, did you do this? And they said, yes. And when I, this is exactly how I said it. I said to one, I said, you're brand new here. Your work product is not spectacular. You have not distinguished yourself in any way. Why did you say all that? Therefore, because I felt like it was an important life lesson for them. Like, therefore, if you do something like this, there's, you, you know, in another situation, you probably would just get fired. But in this situation, you need to learn that, like, you know, don't do something like that. And then the other person said, wow, you're so good at your job. I know who you are. You do such a great job. Why would you do this? Do you know how this looks? It takes all the hard work you did. And it makes me think that, like, I have to worry about you. So I, I, I kind of take it to, like, almost like I'm their parent and I have to well, that, explain that, the that, life that, lesson that's to them. Exactly what I, I, that's exactly the image I had was, yeah. like, oh, okay, you're being a parent. So let me give you a different frame. Yeah. Okay. How did you feel? I felt like these... When you first found out about it. I felt like I'd hired stupid people. I, I just felt like, my God, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Why would you do something so stupid? Don't you understand? Like, it's so easy to get caught doing something like that. And I felt like, well, how dis- 
loyal are you to the company that you would do something like that? Okay. So a combination of so, like... So uh, were they stupid? One of them maybe and the other one okay. definitely not. And were they disloyal? Probably. Okay. So I, I, I don't I don't know. But I don't think they were superly committed. Put it that way. I don't think they were disloyal. Right. But I would say they were not committed to the cause. Right. So there's an opportunity there. Yeah. In that little story yeah. that you tell to demonstrate a kind of more progressive management, hmm. which is to which is to use a model I call OFNR. OFNR. Yeah, observation, feeling, needs, and request. Hmm. You make an observation. The observation is incontrovertible. This happened. Mm -hmm. Did this happen? Yes. So now you have agreement. Hmm. When I see you do this, it makes me question your intelligence. It makes me even question your loyalty. And here's the truth of this company. I need to be surrounded by people whose intelligence I don't question. I need to be surrounded by. We need to build a company where we're not worrying about whether or not we can trust each other. I don't know that I can trust you. So now you have a choice. You can either fire them mm -hmm. or you can say, I'm going to make a request. What What were you thinking when you did this? Did you feel that this was okay? Why, why would you feel yeah. that this was okay? Because if there's some need that you have, like you needed more time for lunch or right. you need to make more money, then why don't you come to me? Yeah. I'm not saying I'm going to meet that need. Right. But at least we can have a dialogue about it. Sure. Because that's what an adult does. Right. See, there was an opportunity implicit in that. See, you fell into the trap of treating them like children. Yeah, I did. Right? For sure. They induced it in you. Because they behaved like children. Absolutely. The opportunity you had was to ask them to behave like an adult. Hmm. By not responding to them like a parent. Ah. See, when you get to do that, then what, then what do you have? You have a company filled with adults, which is a hell of a lot more fun. Oh, absolutely. No, I'm children. trying to have only adults. I mean, let's talk about millennials for a second. Okay. <laughs> this is your complaint. This is my big complaint. Now, remember, I have a 23-year-old and a 20-year-old. So let's talk I a little bit about, about millennials for a millennials. second. <laughs> Managing millennials. You must... You coach some millennials sure. i take it and then you must come up management of millennials sure. what's your take on this because i mean i mean they derided gen x the generation that i came up in and you're on the tail end of like what do you think i think that uh there is uh, in my experience i don't think that there is this big sociological distinction that we like to impose okay i think it's not unlike when we were kids and your parents would say you know how can you listen to that music right, right. rock rap right punk. so but you tell me what's the problem with millennials from your perspective oh i i think they in relation to entrepreneurship yeah there's a portion of them who don't want full-time work and are so purpose-driven that if the purpose is not something like you know the earthquake in tibet they, they're so purpose, they've been, they've been programmed so hard to be purpose driven that they can't see meaning in work. Well, who programmed them? Their parents, the society, like be very purpose driven. Like, is why this would that, your life's why would calling? that stick? I don't know. I guess I just see it in a large number of them. Like they, I don't know if this is my life's purpose is something like that our generation never said and that this generation seems to be saying constantly. So like we we're never, talking about a mythological 24 year old, let's call him. Yeah, mythological. So they were 14, 13, yeah. when 9-11 hit? Yeah. They YOLO. were 18, 19, just entering college when the worst recession since the Great Depression hit. Hmm. They grew up with the Bernie Madoffs of the world. Yeah. I don't know. They I don't buy some slack. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is the YOLO. Like, you only live once. You have to pursue your vision. You know, you have to pursue your dreams. See, I always thought YOLO and... and my kids are going to roll their eyes when they hear me say YOLO. Um, I always thought YOLO was like, you only live once, so go chug that beer. Not, you only live once, so go work for Teach for America. I think... I think know, it's both, actually. It may be. Yeah. It may be. But I, I, but I think, you know, you, you, you made a point before about anxiety and about the sort of mental health issues that, that seem to be rising. I think that there is... A general, there is an increase in dissatisfaction and distrust with institutions. And I think that that uh, 
uh, is borne out in a lot of the things that we're talking about. But in my experience, the thing that a lot of millennials get tagged with, which is that they feel, have a sense of entitlement, they don't want to work hard. It's just not true. They just don't want to work pointlessly. That's it. If they don't see the meaning, they'll work hard if they see meaning. If they don't see meaning, they're just like... Right, so whose fault is that? I mean, the problem is yeah. that we may not be conveying what the meaning of that meaningless job is. So you have to really double or triple down on well, the purpose to, and the mission. You, you, you know, you have to think about like the people who, who were the people who taught you? Who were the people who taught me? Yeah. And who are the people who are teaching me? I just think we I'm were I'm more much, forgiving than you are. Well, I just also think that we, I respect and admire that purpose driven because I do think that we were just told to shut up and work really hard and that the measure was how hard you worked not what you were working on but you sound like my father but it was it was a kind of even for gen x just even in the internet business it was like are you putting in 80 90 hours a week or not you know it's kind of like that whole you know who could one up the other person on how hard they were working on their startup now it's like so what that's is it? that's why you work so hard not anymore i don't actually no, work no. As hard when anymore. you do, when, when you i did, did i think there was some programming that just hard work was absolutely necessary to be successful. You had to grind it out. You had to really lean in and work so hard. So you got up every day and you said, I'm going to grind it out today. I think there was, if I you want you to have... yourself. Well, I did. But I do think also people were like, if you, the path to success was hard work. I think that's after the fact hmm. thinking. I think that as we, what we've talked about before, I think you were chasing some demons. Hmm. And I think in the pursuit of the demons, the fact that you were working hard right. is just a consequence of it. It's right. not like you sat down and said, I'm going to be successful, yeah. so I'm going to work really hard, which is the, the feeling you want those millennials to have. I want people to feel good about working hard and making something. And I find that there is then a Then give of them people. a sense of ownership. Yeah. Do they have a sense of ownership? Do they have a sense a of question. Uh, uh, of empowerment? I mean, I what so. motivated you? It was your own business. Yeah, but not everybody can own the you know, the guy who started the business. I find like also people want to be the guy person who started it. Yeah, well, that's that, a the different originator. Issue. I think I think that's a bigger issue that's going yeah. on right here. It's not so much oh, it's, it's just how many people are, are leaving startups to go do their own startup. Yeah, it's like this origin story is so important to people. Exactly. That's what you know what I started doing to deal with that origin story? I started letting people call themselves co-founders of things they weren't co-founders of. <laughs> so I just started referring I, exactly. I was like, you know what? I started referring to like three or four people who were involved in Weblogs Inc. because they were the co-founders. Right. They came in year two, they came in year month 18, they came in year, you know, month 12. There were really only two people who co-founded, then a third person who arguably was the most important person to join the team, Peter Rojas, but we still call him a co-founder, but he was whatever, See, six I, months in. I, I, would, I would say that that strategy would be even more powerful if you actually believed it. I do believe it, though. Well, I, then you should yeah. lead with that. Ah, okay. Remember, leader is best who, when the work is done, the people say we did this ourselves. Say it again. The leader is best who, when the work is done, the people say we did this ourselves. Ah, right. Okay. That's yeah. Lao Tzu. Chinese philosopher. Got it. I'm okay. writing it Dao down. Dao De Ching. <laughs> All right. right. Question from our audience. Um, how do I resolve a wrong by my co-founder? Because <laughs> you've well, seen this a lot. Yeah. It sort of depends on what the wrong is. Right. I mean, it really, it, 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 you know, but I think this goes back to the question of how do you d have difficult and fearful or fearless conversations? How do you actually approach someone and say, look, remember that OFNR structure mm -hmm. right this is what happened when you did this this is what it made me feel like which is not language we're used to talking about right but then it's undeniable right i no longer trust you because what you did mm. and i have a need and that need is to work with people i trust right so then it's not like you said he said whatever it's it's about resolving what is really going on and oftentimes what we're talking about there is a lack of trust or, or something that has created a sense of betrayal. Hmm. Trust is critical. You I can't guess. build an organization. You can't build a startup without trust. Okay. How do I do a founder loneliness, join a professional peer group organization, therapy? This one you must get a lot. It's a lonely job. It's a very lonely job. And, and I think my big 
push right now is for peer support. Hmm. There aren't enough coaches in the world, there are not enough therapists in the world who actually understand what's going on here. And so I'm a big believer in peer support. One of the reasons why I think the work we're doing in these conversations, the work Brad does and talking about, Brad Feld does in, in talking about his, his uh, struggles with depression and his blog, is encouraging people to talk about what's going on. Mm. I think in doing that, you make it acceptable and safe for other people to talk about it, to raise their hand. The way we were talking before about the emails that I've been getting. Mm. So I think talk, how do you deal with the founder loneliness is really a function of... of learning to be okay with talking about it, hmm. not being afraid. That may be the demon that you've got to put your head up to the mouth of. I started asking people, what is the thing that people are most concerned about in like meetings, like weekly staff meetings, stuff like that? What are people most concerned about right now? Boy, does that like you mean with, Of your own staff? Yeah, the team. Like what are you each individually most worried about? Like I what are that. people like so concerned about that they just don't want to bring up or I what love is the, that. the big fear is that's been transformative and, wh- and what's happened well people are like this isn't going to work and we're all going to lose our jobs right and i how, mean that how is how do the, you handle that well we have x amount of we have 24 months of runway and so, we're all really smart so we have 24 months to figure it out and that puts us at march of you know 2016 so do we think we are smart enough to figure this out in that amount of time i don't think you could if it can't be figured out in that amount of time, I don't think we're gonna anybody could figure it out. Right. So what I like about your response yeah. is that that you didn't sugarcoat anything. Right. You told the truth. Right. Always. Which I really, really admire. And you didn't over dramatize it. Right. 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 Which is, oh my God, you're right. Right. And freak out. Yeah. Um, you could also consider, you know, if I were coaching that person, I yeah. might say, so what would happen if you lost your job? Hmm. Right. Deal with it. What would happen? Right? Have you ever lost your job, Jason? You take one of the seven other job opportunities you have. Would you really be homeless and penniless? <laughs> Not if you're in the tech industry. Right. Not by a long shot. Right. So let's deal with that. Yeah. Right? So if you, if you can visualize it, if you can I- ideate around it, then you can actually manage it. You cut that demon down to size. Okay, let's take a final one here. Um, the business is almost out of money. What is the most most ethical way to lay people off? What I like about that question is that it implies that laying people off is unethical. Or that running yeah. out of money is unethical. Do you hear the guilt? That is some serious guilt, yeah. That's some serious guilt. Well, because you, we did say earlier that the CEO's job is to provide the resources for people to do their job, which resources equals money. Sometimes. It is the fundamental basis of these startups. that Sometimes. You need to have... Companies with cash in the bank don't go out of business. Uh, 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 yes. The CEO's job is to make sure that there's enough fuel in the tank. And if there no is not enough fuel in the tank, it is whose fault? Sometimes it's the two guys who flew an airplane into the Twin Towers. Ah, fair enough. External factor. Sometimes it's, you know, collapse Bear Stearns w- <laughs> betting too he- or Lehman betting too heavily on subprime mortgages. Right. Sometimes it has nothing whatsoever to do with you. Yeah, right. probably 50% of the time. Probably 50%, maybe even more. Yeah. Right? When those windows close, so, that's so, brutal. So, so you want to balance that. You want to you want to understand it. Sometimes it is your fault. Hmm. Okay? Sometimes like I I I I know a CEO who hates fundraising and guess what? He's always running out of cash. Cuz he doesn't fundraise. He needs to okay. get a co-founder or a president who can fundraise, my goodness. Right. So the question is, how do you handle a layoff? And I say, you tell the truth. Yeah. You tell the truth. I fucked up. I thought there was going to be money. Or I thought there was going to be a business here. I thought there was going to be a business here. I was wrong. Hmm. It's a startup. It's a startup. We set out with an 80% chance of failure, and we are part of that 80% that (laughs) failed. 80, 90. I think that that is really one of the things that can set people free as an entrepreneur. Mm is that you get multiple swings at the bat and any idea worth doing, I mean, this, this is what gets, keeps me going in the moments of hardship, yeah. is I haven't been defined by one you know, startup or product or success or failure. Yeah. I've transcended one. Yeah. I mean, and I know I can always get up the next day and start over with a clean sheet of paper and sketch something out or have another inspiration. 
And so once you have that, that none of these things are going to define you or kill you or whatever. Did you, you know that when you, that, that when, when you did Silicon Alley? Repair? That I didn't know it then. Right, right. No, See, so that I lived with the, taught you that. Yeah, the experience with that. Because when the first one, right. I would stay up at night right. worrying about payroll. I right. would grind my teeth like, oh my God, if this right. goes down, I will never be able to work again. So my, my response is, is uh, experience teaches you otherwise. Yeah. But also, um, the American culture is actually quite forgiving. Oh my God, is it? And there are emerging startup communities where that is just simply not true. And that the that you know failure is is so unacceptable on a society level that yeah. that, that the fear of this is um, based in a kind of society level reality. We're fortunate in our society in American culture that uh, actually we give people second and third chances. All right, final one is sharing your fear since we get on the fear theme with your team a good idea or not. Yeah, I get this a lot of times. And uh, what I often say to people is that there's really two ways to share the fears. One is, I'm really afraid. <laughs> That's not a good way to do it. I am shitting my pants right now. I'm shitting. <laughs> right. That, that's not actually sharing fears. That's asking somebody else to be afraid for you. Ah, that's interesting. Right. You're trying to share the panic. Right. Unload it, maybe. Unload it. Ah. Pass the baton. Ah. That's not what I recommend. But I do recommend pausing, connecting back to purpose, connecting back to what you truly believe. Do you believe in the product? Do you believe in the mission? Do you believe in the market opportunity? Do you still believe in those things? Do you believe in the team? Yeah. Then you lead with that. Okay? I'm afraid. But I still believe in the market. I still believe in the team. I still believe in the opportunity for these reasons. Right? That's telling the truth. Remember Warren Bennis. That's telling the truth. That's the full 360, too. It's like we are we have only four months of cash left, but this is a great product with a great team and a great market opportunity. We're going to figure it out. It, it goes back to deluding yourself or not deluding yourself, right? It goes back to telling the truth. It what goes, about going up to like board and investors? Yeah. Really? Best story I ever tell. Okay. John Connolly, Mainspring. Have I told you that? I story? remember Mainspring. You remember Mainspring? Of course. Okay. Yeah. About nine, ten months after we invested in Mainspring, which was our second investment at Flatiron, John, we go into a board meeting, and I'm all excited about this company. And John Connolly sits the board down. He clears the rooms, just him and the CFO and the board. And he says, we're fucked. hey -o. Product doesn't work. We're a month away from launching, and the product is wrong. We have $5 million in the bank. Here's what I propose we do. We either shut the doors right now and I give you guys the money back, what money we have left, or give us four weeks... The CFO and I will come back to you with a plan. If you want to fund us at that point, we'll figure out the terms in which we do that and we'll go forward. It's your choice. That took guts. He yeah. fired 50 people, rebuilt the company. Two years later, we sold the company for $250 million to IBM. And it wouldn't have even survived if he had just been persevered through the wrong product. And he, he would not, the re, and I was scared shit. This was one of my first investments at Flatiron. Mm. But Paul Mader and Bill Kaiser, Paul from Highland and Bill from Greylock were on the board. They had been through Coursera with John mm -hmm. before. They knew they could trust him. They said, John, we got you back. Mm. They gave him the four weeks. They came back, came back with a good plan, rebuilt the company from the ground up with $5 million instead of 10, which is what we had in the bank originally, right? and created a great return on investment. Hmm. John is one of the most fearless CEOs I've ever encountered. How can you be more fearless? Because I sometimes I think maybe I'm too conservative. I mean, and I've deployed tens of millions of dollars in my career. Do you tell the truth? Do I tell the truth? All, All the time. I do, yeah. To but your like, investors? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but I'm saying, how do you become more fearless like... Take bigger risks. Be even more, you know, I think gambling. Because sometimes I feel like that is... Being fearless is a function of actually acknowledging that you're afraid. Huh. Right? You, to, to, to know fearlessness, you mm. have to know fear. You have to feel it. Right. Not deny it. 
and then you do it anyway. So what's the biggest thing? What's, what scares you as an entrepreneur? Well, not, not much any. The, the actually fear I have now is maybe not going big enough. Of course, listen, I'm 42. Yeah. This is my last go round, right? Like I got what? 18 years left. I'll do this till I'm 60. I'm done. So I got maybe two companies left in me. Am I going big enough? You know, I guess being friends with Elon Musk is kind of problematic for me because I sit with the guy and, and you know, it's like when I talk to other entrepreneurs, they're like, yeah, I'm building something to deliver food to your house that's vegan. And I'm like, wow, that's really cute. I'm going to build inside.com and it's got this grand vision, you know? Or he's going to solve. But then I'm like talking to this guy and it's like, yeah, well, you know, in my spare time, I'm going to build the fifth mode of transportation while I'm colonizing, colonizing Mars. And by the way, I made the car that's got the greatest safety resident. I mean, it does sometimes, like, and I tell him this sometimes and other folks, you know, like, this is really bad having you as a friend because I feel like anything I do, like, I, I got to, like. Swim in your own lane. Right, but I mean. Swim in, in your, your own lane. lane. Hmm. Okay. Your job isn't to live Elon's life. I know, but do you, don't you get the sense that sometimes you should go a little bit bigger? The question is, are you going the way you're supposed to go? Not, are you going bigger as compared to Elon? You know, it's not, it's not a case of bigger, but like, he seems to hit the throttle harder. And I still he feel like some, does. sometimes I don't hit the throttle hard enough. He I, I think does. I'm, I see that in a lot of entrepreneurs, they hit the throttle harder than I do. I'm kind of conservative, like I don't want to flip the car. If no, that's you, the fear. Well, you don't want to lose the money. I feel bad about losing money. Yes, of course. Yes. Does Alon worry about no. losing money? No. Didn't he come come close to bankruptcy when he, he was in Tesla? He was. He was officially bankrupt. He didn't even file. He didn't file for bankruptcy. The creditors didn't drag him into court. He wasn't. He didn't file for bankruptcy, but he was negative. Right. So he was technically bankrupt. Technically, he was bankrupt. He said that publicly. Yeah. Right. So I just feel like that's the gene that really makes great entrepreneurs. I don't have that. So you're not a great entrepreneur. I, maybe I'm a good entrepreneur, I think, at the end of the day. But to be a great entrepreneur, I think you have to have a, a – I think you have to just be able to turn off that – th Let me ask you. Does, you have to burn does, more fuel. How, how does Alon feel about himself? How did he feel about himself when he was in negative? That was not a good time. Yeah, but did he think that he still had bad ideas? No, did, I think he knew he had the right idea. He just thought, my God, the financial crisis happening while I'm building okay, a so car company. Okay, so it sucked – but his sense of self-esteem actually wasn't – his sense of the, the rightness of his ideas wasn't attached No, he never wavered. Not once. To success. Yeah. No, no, no. He knew he was on the right ideas. He knew he was executing perfectly. He just knew, my God, the financial crisis and Lehman and Bear Stearns, it's going to – could wipe everything out. Right. The world is ending. Right. Yeah. Right. But that's Kinda a Kind of like you're in 9-11. Exactly. So it all dovetails. So the external circumstances are such a big part of what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I got to go raise more money and just hit the gas <laughs> harder. <laughs> and be like, play this clip. Jerry Colonna told me I need to raise more money and burn it faster. I got to turn up the fuel. All right, listen, Jerry, this has been amazing. I talked to you for hours. Thanks to our sponsors. Everybody go to uh, Leadership Reboot, leadershipreboot.com and apply. Well, it's too late, but you'll be applying for the second one. There'll be a yes. second one. Now, this is going to be like, what, 10 dimes? $10,000 to go? What is the, what is 10, the fee? 10000 So $10,000, seemingly, so that would be like slightly more than Ted, but includes everything. It includes everything. So that's it about the include same. doesn't include airfare. doesn't include, but it includes the hotel? Basically, it's four coaches, four days, $2,500 a coach, basically. So you basically, get. you know, like if you think about it versus going to Ted or the D conference, it's the same price, except at those, you're just watching people on stage, and here, you've got four people working with you for four, almost four days. Right. So it's worth much more than that. You try, it's a cheap price, actually. I think, I think so. It's worth much more. Because I just think about it. Ted's 8000 The I D think, conference is 6000 I think. I think the challenge. Plus hotel. I think the challenge is for a lot of people who are, who are cash-strapped. It's, it's oh, challenge. yeah. Well, you can give, like, two scholarships for every whatever. Once we get the system going. Yeah, just we reserve a couple, couple spots for people exactly. who are bootstrapped. You can do sliding or scale. Or if you're, or whatever. If you're venture-backed, I can't think that there is any better use of 10K than to send your person to this well, retreat. Well, what's interesting is most of the VCs that I know have said, this is a really wise use of your money. Go use this. Absolutely really it like is. That. I mean, if the CEO and the leader is not tight, I mean, that's the end. Exactly. I mean, exactly. that's an easy insurance payment for these VCs. I think so. 
All right, listen. Thanks so much. Uh, Thank you. You're, uh, this is going to be another great episode, and you didn't make me cry, but we'll get to that the next time. You got it. Um, at South by Southwest. Oh, yeah. We're going we're to do the twist. All- I think we're going to do This Week in Startups All-Stars. This is my, this is my strategy. People tell me if they like it. Um, this Week in Startups All-Stars, mm-hmm. whoever the top five traffic getters are up to that point, which right now would be you, Saka, and uh, Eric Reese and Fred Wilson. Can you imagine? And then maybe... Um, yeah, Gary Vaynerchuk. Like, uh, uh, unless I knock Fred out. Yeah, you could knock him out of the final four. But imagine <laughs> if I did Twist All Stars and then the four of you were up there and we just did advice to entrepreneurs. So this is what I was thinking. Like an hour and a half of entrepreneurs coming up saying, here's my biggest problem, and then one of the four panelists answers it. Of the All Stars. It'd be cool. All right. Thanks All right. a lot, Jerry Colonna. Everybody follow Jerry Col- Is it Jerry Colonna or Jay Colonna? What are you on Twitter? Uh, Jerry Colonna. Yeah, at Jerry Colonna uh, on Twitter. And we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups.